Hello again, it's Professor Lusheen. This is lecture 28, I believe. Man, we're getting close. Uh, this is going to be on confined spaces. Uh, specifically, the OSHA standard is 29 CFR 1910 146, permit required confined space entry. But we're going to kind of cover it from more of a comprehensive perspective. Uh, I want you to understand what they are, what the issues are, um, and just kind of give you some of the highlights from this particular standard. Now, what's interesting and why this topic tends to be uh, set to the end of the semester is it actually will go back to and address things we learned in other, t in other lectures. Uh, the, uh, the chemistry, or have you seen the industrial hygiene, uh, fall protection, welding, um, and, and others. So let's get to it. So this is again a, this is a borrowed uh, presentation from an OSHA training institute. Uh, you should have, uh, if you're in a workplace, all confined spaces should be labeled and they should be also mapped out so that people don't accidentally or incidentally enter them without the proper assessment um, or authorization, really. So a confined space is one that's large enough uh, so an employee can bodily enter it to perform work, uh, has limited or restricted leams, means for entry or exit. It gives you some examples here, and these are pretty standard examples. Um, and then it's also not designed for continuous human occupancy. So basically, if you have difficulty getting into it, such as you have to go in through a manhole or a port on the side of a tank or um, an entry point at the top of a silo, these are all considered confined space entries because um, it says you're not designed for hu uh, continuous human occupancy, which is to say it does not have um, uh, adequate lighting that are, that's given in it. And number two, it's not provided with adequate ventilation for continuous human occupancy. I mean, you might say, oh, well, well a closet, you know, is not designed for continuous human occupancy. It's also easy to get into. So you might think, well, what about an attic? It's difficult to get into an attic. Yeah, an attic could be considered a confined space uh, given its orientation of getting up there and getting out, whether it has lighting, or whether it has ventilation. It really depends. I think they actually consider a uh, like a, an air handler a confined space because you have to go in through a little port in order to do inspection of the equipment or change out filters. Uh, if it doesn't have lighting or adequate ventilation, it could be considered a confined space. Now, one question is going to be whether it's considered a permit required confined space. A permit required confined space is one that has set, you know one of several conditions. Uh, does it contain a hazardous atmosphere? Does it contain the potential for engulfing the entrant? Is it configured so somebody could be trapped or asphyxiated, which is to say suffocated, uh, by converging or downward sloping uh, walls or changing walls? Uh, or it contains other serious safety or health hazards. And that could be, you know, could you be electrocuted? Could you be, you know, bitten by an animal? You know, is it possible, uh, you know, that all of a sudden it could flood or something like that? Here are some basic examples, but these are cartoons. So let's talk a little bit about the configuration. So uh, is it open? Are there obstacles, barriers, obstructions within the space? So something like a water tank, it's got water <laughs> as an obstacle. Does it have obstruction? So it's, it's difficult to maneuver. Uh, one way you want to think of it is usually when somebody gets lowered into a confined space, they have to put up a tripod at the entry point. The person has to have a harness on and then they're clipped in. Because if they were to lose consciousness or become disabled, you could then kind of crank them out, almost like you know, like a fishing pole type of thing. If they're in a vertical entry, sometimes what you do is you put on a lifeline, and then they could be you know pulled out. But saving for a clear pathway, you may actually have to have someone come in in order to extract, and that can be difficult in itself. So you have to consider all potential like existing obstacles and obstacles that could actually um, change or come into play when the person's on the inside because of the work that's going on. If it's elevated, um, you know, is the opening above grade? Because I know that they, I, I've uh, you know, observed or assessed uh, people have to go up a ladder to get into a space and it's, it's difficult to move around. It's not really designed for continuous human occupancy. Um, and they got electrocuted. And so it took the emergency or the rescue crews like over two hours to extricate the body. So, you know, if they were in harm's, you know, if they just got injured and they needed help, you know, climbing down, 
that could have taken a very, very long time. Uh, there's also below ground. Below ground is what you typically see when it comes to confined space entry. So underground type work, sewer type work, uh, underground pits, underground vaults, underground tanks, all these things underground kind of increases the danger. The portal size that it has it here and the classification for entry is that uh, any body part goes through the entry point. You know, it's like putting the, the football out and breaking the plane of the goal. It's kind of the same thing because you could put your head into a vat, tank, whatever, and one breath could contain enough toxins to kill you. So that's considered entry. And when you put something into a space, that space has to be um, displaced and sometimes the, the substance comes rolling out. So it talks about horizontal and vertical. I kind of already talked about that. Horizontal, again, it says the retrieval line. I call that a lifeline. It can be difficult, especially if they're climbing over, under, or around things. They can be they, they can get caught up. Vertical, it has the same issue, unless they're just working straight down and they could just be retrieved. So here are the different sections under 29 CFR 1910-146. I'm not going to read this whole thing to you, but it's about um, being able to evaluate and um, classify uh, whether it's a confined space or not, whether it's permit required or not. Uh, the protocol you're going to go through, if it's permit required, you have to assess the atmosphere of it, uh, possibly go through a lockout takeout procedure depending on what's in the area, possibly use ventilation to um, clear out the space or continuously ventilate to make sure no toxic or um, oxygen deficient atmosphere develops while the workers are in. If they're gonna be do welding, you have to do a hot work permit to make sure that the gases are kept outside the space, um, that the welding's done, that there's a, an, um, an observer or an attendant always watching and in constant communication, that the air is possibly continuously monitored, um, that the ventilation is constantly running. There's all kinds of things you need to do depending on why you're entering the space, what can be, what sort of conditions are in the space, or how can they be uh, made safer, and how could they evolve when the, when the worker's in it. So there's safety and health issues when it comes to confined space, or in particular, permit required confined spaces. The appendices have a lot of great information to help, you know, uh, companies or organizations with it. So here's a probably a pre-entry checklist. You have the supervisor on the right, you've got the, I believe, the um, attendant on the left, and you've got the entrant in, this, in the middle. And you can see they've got the tripod there. You see the uh, yellow flexible, uh, um, what do you call it, conduit behind there. So it looks like they are actually doing some venting work. Um, and you can see that the entrant, they're in a, a harness, and it looks like they've got a 15 minute escape tank on their hip and it looks like they're going to be putting on a full face respirator. Um, and they're going to be, it looks like they're going to be on an airline. An airline's going to be sent down. So they're bringing in their own breathing air. The attendant is the individual stationed outside with one or more, outside one or more permit spaces who monitors authorized entrance and performs all attendance duties assigned. Here there are duties. Know the hazards that they may be facing. Be aware of possible behavioral effects of the hazard ex hazardous exposure. Continuously maintain accurate count of authorized entrance. Remain outside the permit space during entry operations until relieved by another attendant. So they are the person who is supposed to be continually in communication with entrance, possibly getting updates on whether the conditions are changing, and they're the one who would uh, notify or begin a, a rescue procedure. Communicates with authorized entrance, monitors activities inside and outside, summons rescue or emergency services, performs all non-entry rescues, um, so if they can just pull the person out, and then performs uh, no duties that might interfere with this. So there we have the attendant. Another one is the entrant. Obviously, that's a person who goes in. They need to know what they're going to be going up against. They need to be properly trained on the use of equipment they're going to be using to be able to communicate with the attendant. Uh, they need to alert the attendant whenever there's a change or a sign of something going wrong, um, if they detect any prohibited condition, and then exit as quickly as possible. In order to exit, in order to evacuate, given the attendant or the entry 
order the evacuation, order to evacuate is given. Oh, they have to leave if they're told to. Enter to recognize any warning sign or symptom. Uh, entrant detects any prohibited uh, condition or evacuation alarm is sounded. That doesn't look like a fun pit to go in. He doesn't look happy. I, I hope that's not excrement. It might be. Um, so here's different definitions. And the reason I say that almost every year we have a multiple fatality incident in which somebody climbs down into a manure pit. If you don't aren't familiar with that concept, so if you are um, raising animals, uh, their feces are collected and they go into a pit. And sometimes what they do is that um, when, it, when it fills up, they um, pull it out and they can spray it on fields um, to, nu to uh, n add nutrients to the soil. Um, but the, the air within the pit itself is toxic. It has hydrogen sulfide in it, and um, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but hydrogen sulfide is toxic to humans, and it, it can kill you. Um, and the thing is, when you are when you climb down into a pit and you're in a confined space and you're overcome, uh, if you haven't followed proper procedures, you either don't have the capability to make a decision to climb out. You physically can't climb out um, because uh, you're not getting enough oxygen. And then you just pass out, and then it's just a matter of time before you um, your body shuts down. Thing is, with these manure pits, is that somebody somebody comes by and looks in. You know, they're not seeing any hazard; they just see a person uh, on the ground. Um, so they climb down to see what's going on, and then they get overcome. And usually, the third person figures it out, but not always. So it's usually a multiple fatality. Engulfment is when you are surrounding or effective capture of a person by liquid or finely divided solids. So sort of a, an engulfment is like a cave-in, if you will, or it could be liquid as well. Um, can exert enough force in the body to cause death by strangulation, constriction, or crushing. That's what happens in grain silos. So they're using an auger or a screw conveyor to remove uh, grain. And sometimes what happens is, especially when there's moisture, is um, there can be a void that develops because it's kind of crusted near the top. And you're not supposed to go in there, but sometimes people go in there to see what's going on, and then their body weight is enough to collapse the void, and they fall into that air pocket, but then the grain fills in around them. So every time they breathe in and then out, it, it, it compresses it even more to the point where, so you, you don't have to actually have the grain go over your head to suffocate them, it, the compression of the grain or the surrounding earth could kill them as well through strangulation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So entry is when any any part of the person enters the space. Yeah. The entry supervisor. So what do they do? Well, they're supposed to be in charge of it. They have to make sure that the permit is actually filled out. And the permit is exactly the way it sounds. Before you go into a permit required confined space, you should know what could possibly be in there. You go through and check everything to make sure it is safe for someone to enter. The entry supervisor may serve as the attendant as long as that person is trained and equipped and also then they're not distracted by their supervisory role. They need to know the hazards, including symptoms of um, exposure, uh, verify, you know, they're the one who fills out the permit, basically do the tests and possibly do continuous testing, and they terminate entry and cancel permit as required. They verify the rescue services are available, either on site or, or are, are aware that they, of what they may be coming into. They have the capa they have the proper equipment and training to do so. Uh, remove unauthorized individuals who attempt to enter and determine whenever a responsible permit space entry operation is transferred at intervals as indicated. So what's a hazardous atmosphere? One that could basically either kill or incapacitate or impair, basically. So um, the four things that are, uh, there are four things that are measured uh, for hazardous atmosphere. One is flammable gas, and they're just looking for, they, they wanna make sure it stays below 10% of its lower flammability limit. Um, that includes combustible dust. Uh, okay, it says, uh, no, concentration may be approximated as condition in which dust obscures vision at a distance of five feet or less. Yeah, that'd be over 15 milligrams per meter cube based on my IH background. Atmospheric oxygen concentration is between 19.5 and 23.5. If it's below 19.5, it's considered oxygen deficient. 
Um, at that point, you're not getting as much oxygen as you're used to. Um, that's when people can start exhibiting um, confusion, um, weakness, fatigue, and they may not be able to self-rescue. If it's above 23.5, it's considered oxygen enriched, in which things will burn more readily. And so that's like an added um, danger. If the condition contains more than the PEL or permissible exposure limit, you may have to do something to try to keep it down or put uh, personal protective equipment on the person. But then there's something called IDLH, immediate danger to life and health. And if you have that condition, you know, you really should be sending them in. You should try to vent it. Um, but you could, they could possibly be sent in with an SCBA or an airline. Oh, I actually got ahead of myself. <laughs> I've actually done air sampling in confined spaces and found IDLH before. It's kind of scary. Uh, so isolation, process in which a permit space is uh, removed from service. Uh, you can do things like blanking, binding, whatever it is, trying to keep... Uh, this is when you're just trying to... This is a form of lockout takeout, in a way. Trying to keep things from leaking in. Oh, look at There's a lockout takeout valve cover. Okay, I, I, when I was reading, I wish they had just called it lockout takeout. So there's something we had talked about before. Uh, line breaking. I think what you're trying to do is trying to empty it out. Uh, rescue services. Uh, sometimes when you hire a contractor who does confined space entry, they bring their own. Otherwise, what you need to do is you need to check with your local rescue to make sure that they have a confined space rescue trailer. Because if they don't have the equipment, they're not going to go in. Yeah, you got to talk to them first. You can't just go, oh, let's let's just do this confined space work. Oh, somebody went down. Let's just call 911. They may not have the they may not have the resources or the training to do it. You got to check with them first. Here's someone who was extricated, looks like through the, uh, and they're performing first aid. I believe the um, the attendant is required to be uh, CPR certified. I believe. Here's all the retrieval system. The thing is, when the person is 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 you know weak or not weak but out passed out and their body is um, drooping. It may be difficult to get them up through the hole. You may have to, you know, you have to be trained to do it properly. So testing, you use a four gas meter to test the air. And what you usually do is there's a probe that you can put down into the hole and then it, it gives you back the O2 levels, the uh, L, LEL or LFL, you know, it wants to be 10% of it. Um, it didn't say hydrogen sulfide, but hydrogen sulfide is also tested and so does carbon monoxide because we had talked about carbon monoxide in a previous lecture that uh, the human body prefers it over oxygen. It's a, it's a chemical asphyxiant. So if there's carbon monoxide down there, which probably it would have to come from, uh, it's an incomplete combustion of uh, carbon fuel, um, the people could be overcome and, and die. So here's a testing protocol. So they say potential toxic air. You're looking for hydrogen sulfide, which is a natural byproduct of organic decay. It's the, you know, sulfur in, in organic um, entities um, or through their metabolism can give up hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is heavier than air, so it tends to um, concentrate uh, at the lowest point. Uh, it smells like rotten eggs, thus the sulfur, hydrogen sulfide. Um, also, it has a sinister by symptom in which it, um, it numbs our olfactory gland or ability to smell it. So at higher concentrations, you no longer smell the sulfur. So you don't think it's there anymore. So don't rely on your sense of smell when it comes to confined spaces. So it looks like here they were testing for hydrogen sulfide and for um, carbon monoxide. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, methane is the primary uh, degradation byproduct of organic materials. Yes, but methane is heavier than air. And also methane is a flammable gas, so therefore it would be detected through the LEL, the percent LEL. Ugh, I hate spiders. So you have to look out for these things as well. There could be snakes, there could be spiders, um, uh, ticks, but yeah, ticks you can just wear clothing over. But there are, there are different types of um, Animals, there could be rodents down there uh, that can bite. Um, 
BA, so you got to be careful for that. Yikes. Uh, signage, so all confined spaces need to be labeled. Here it says do not enter, even though it's on its side here. Manhole covers are pretty heavy, um, so you don't have to label those. This should have a labeling. You probably should have a cover as well. Here's an example of um, the supervisor completing the confined space entry permit, and I'll show you what that looks like. Here's the what a written program needs to identify. I mean, you really need to know what you're doing. You just can't just show up and go, oh, I can figure this out. It needs to be all really well labeled, uh, laid out, and the appendices for 1910-146 um, provides that. So here is an example of a confined space entry permit that I found online. And it goes through a checklist. I'm not a fan of checklists except for things like this. This is a verification step and not an exploratory step. So you're checking for all these things. It makes you kind of think it all through. You're doing testing and you're keeping records of it. For CFM, so the presentation didn't talk about ventilation. We talked about ventilation. If you have hydrogen sulfide in your space, how do you get it out when it's concentrated near the lowest point? Ventilation is all about suck and blow and just get your mind out of the gutter for a second. So if something's low, what you do is you drop in a conduit and you suck it out. So you, you blow it out over here and then the, the air that's in the direct vicinity of the, of the entry point will then pull it in. So you have clean air brought in and you, so the, therefore you have to make sure you're not still running your vehicles near there. It needs to be just air that gets in. That's what, that's what you have to do when something concentrates, you have to suck it out. Now, if you have um, things that tend to be either mixing within the, the, the normal uh, different levels of air or tend to rise, so, you know, methane, carbon monoxide, then what you'd wanna do is push air into the floor of the space. Because as you're pushing the fresh air in, it's gonna force air to come out. And because it's heavy, because it's lighter than air, it's going to follow that pathway. So that's how you make sure. And sometimes you have to do a, you have to have that on continuously to make sure that no dangerous atmospheres um, develop. And what's interesting, it says you know CFM required si ventilation and CFM, the size of it, pre-entry time. So what you could do is you could almost set it up that here's the space. I want to turn it over. Um, uh, six times per hour, similar to the uh, flammable liquid storage room. And you can do the calculation as far as what size blower you would need to push in whatever CFM to get that kind of change over. See, all this stuff ties together. Told you. What else did I provided you? So you can actually go to the, please go to the OSHA confined space page. They talk about it quite a bit. I just think it's interesting that this combines a lot of the stuff from our other. We didn't really even talk about welding and hot work, um, but I want you to watch this OSHA confined spaces video. It's 24 minutes long. It'll reiterate some of the things I had, but also add some stuff. Here's a 12 minute video of uh, asphyxiation by nitrogen. Uh, this is a chemical safety board video. And then here's an actual fatality that occurred. Um, person's doing welding in a confined space. Obviously, the gases are in there with them because there's a buildup and then it ignites. I'll let you see that. And then as far as fatalities go, we can actually look up fatalities in the, on the OSHA website. As you can see, it's got a list of a few of them here. You know, I just searched it. You could search it too. Uh, this is in 2017 down in Florida, I believe. Uh, three workers who entered a manhole died uh, became, because it contained lethal levels of hydrogen sulfide and carbon monoxide which should have been detected if they used a four gas meter. So that is everything I wanted to share with you on confined spaces. Please look into this. Um, and if you ever have to do work in the future revolving around confined spaces, make sure you understand what hazards are there and how you can control them, what hazards could develop while the person's in there, try to prevent them and go through the steps, go through the verification steps. You can save lives.